A Roman legionary, a feathered octopus, and a literal Nazi walk into a bar. Only there's no punchline because this isn't a joke. It's the plot of a Hugo Award-winning novel. Let's read The Big Time by Fritz Lieber. <music> 2017 is a year I've devoted to catching up on past Hugo Award winners. While I'm sure there are many strong titles on this list, The Big Time is not. Oh, Boy, is it not. My first clue should have been the overly verbose introduction by the author. The second clue is no one cover for this book seems to know what imagery to depict. Modern covers have done a better job in simplifying the concept, but the retro covers are so curiously bizarre. Deep in the past and stretching far into the future, a war is raging. The breadth of this conflict is known as the Change War, fought by troops plucked from throughout time, usually moments before their canonical deaths. These people still die, but a temporarily separated duplicate is made somehow. There are two sides, snakes and spiders, though their motives for fighting are unknown. This mishmash of troops fight in other battles throughout history, placing hussars next to navy seals and, for all I know, vikings alongside even more navy seals. As a result of these battles, disruptions to the timeline are constant, and many participants struggle with memories that may or may not be true anymore. Victory at Waterloo one week could also mean a horrific loss when the battle is fought again and again. There's even mention of the United States losing to Axis powers and being occupied by Nazis for a time, and oh, I get it, this book just became relevant again. But that's all set up. The big time is a train, and the little time is the countryside, and we're on the train. Unless we go out a door, you can't time travel through the time you travel in when you time travel. Are you following me? The story takes place in a place known as The Place, a combination hospital-slash-bar-slash-art museum where soldiers can heal and relax in between deployments. A range of first aid, psychological, and sexual counseling is provided by the bartenders. Greta is our main character and entertainer, a host to a recent batch of returned infantry. In actuality, she's an observer, and a poor one at that. Really, more a camera without a lens? The book could be changed to third-person omniscient from first-person, and it wouldn't have made a difference. Did I mention Greta's boyfriend is a feathered octopus? Look, there's a Nazi in this book, and he's on our side. That, of course, is the tricky part. It's never clear what being on the side of snakes or spiders really means, an observation that the characters themselves are aware of. It highlights a separation of motives between people fighting the war from the commanders who deem it necessary, and it may be the book's sole strength. The parts I got the most out of are chapters where our heroes navel gaze over pints. There are some wonderful ruminations about war and death. I'll try to share a few, but they're incredibly long and might not make sense out of context. It's great to be a Faust, even in a pack of other Fausts. It's sweet to jigger reality, to twist the whole course of a man's life or a culture's, to ink out his or its past and scribble in a new one, and be the only one to know and gloat over the changes. It's sweet to feel the change winds blowing through you and know the pasts that were and the past that is and the pasts that may be. It's sweet to wield the Atropos and cut a zombie or unborn out of his lifeline and look the doubleganger in the face and see the resurrection glow in it and recruit a brother, welcome a newborn fellow demon into our ranks, and decide whether he'll best fit his soldier, entertainer, or what. It's even sweet to have change death poised over your neck, to know that the past isn't the precious, indestructible thing you've been taught it was, to know that there's no certainty about the future either, whether there'll even be one, to know that no part of reality is holy, that the cosmos itself may wink out like a flicked switch, and God be not, and nothing left but nothing. There's a lot of good writing in this book that is destroyed by some awful storytelling. The big time is problematic as it contains the literal objectification of women. The place provides female companions called ghost girls. How they come to this consensually is never explained, and so I assume that it isn't. Ghost girls are vacuum-packed into envelopes and stored in the bar's back room, which leads me to another problem. Numerous whimsical technologies are crammed onto every page. As many words are given to the technology as are given to the ruminations on war. If I haven't spoken about the characters, there really isn't much to say. Greta has a feathered octopus boyfriend. They like to cuddle. The Nazi likes to exclaim German catchphrases. Um... The middle of the story stops being interesting as soon as it tries to create any type of plot, dissolving into overripe mush by its end. The characters are trapped in a cardboard box, and there's nothing for them to do inside it. In the end, much significance is lost scrambling to defuse a nuclear bomb that is brought into the place by other visiting soldiers. Also, one of them could be a traitor. Uh, 
Yeah, no, it's it's peril without substance as the let's talk about war aspect is tossed aside in favor of a needless MacGuffin. All things change and we change with them might be the message of the story if it wasn't so muddled. Maybe it's a metaphor for how rapidly the world changes, I don't really know, because that is a literal message I cheated and took the passage directly from the book. Perhaps there are some sentimentalists who would rather die forever than go on living in a world without the summer. The field equations, process and reality, Hamlet, Matthew, Keats, and the Odyssey. But our masters are practical creatures, ministering to the needs of those rugged souls who want to go on living no matter what. What is the cost of war? Is that cost worth it if we sacrifice all the things we originally fought and stood for? Is it okay to shift the goalpost if it means we all get to keep playing on the same field? They're all questions common to this type of narrative. There's a feeling that this book was well ahead of its time, though it's clear that after publishing, that time shortly arrived and then promptly passed. In 1956, the Korean War had only been over for a few years, and the Vietnam War had only just begun. It seems likely that these conflicts gave rise to the ideas in this book, ideas that needed time to ferment and much more time to brew. Since then, times have certainly changed. The Big Time is a very short book, and if it were to be nominated nowadays, it would likely be listed under the best novella category. Ultimately, it was a look into science fiction past, and thankfully, the genre has so much more sophistication and clarity nowadays. Ah well, on to the next book. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. Before I go, I'd like to address the elephant in the room. And that is, well, the fact that I've changed, both as a person and as a being. A wonderful thank you to Kendall Hale for providing the illustrations for this new puppet. Moving ahead, I can now inhabit a form that will never grow old, never get tired, and never die.